Live from KSAT 12, the 6 o'clock news starts right now. We've got thunder, we've got lightning out there. Question is, who will be lucky enough to see some of this rain? Yeah, and it's a beautiful sight out there. Let's check in with Adam Kasky. Yeah, east side of town along 410, even 1604. That's where we really have had the sweet spot today. We're looking off to the northwest, up I-10 from 410, and the sky started to clear out a little bit there. But elsewhere, we still have areas of good soaking rain. Here's the big picture, and you see just widely separated downpours. The white lines indicating lightning strikes, the cloud to ground lightning strikes. Off to the north of San Antonio, moving into Bull Verde, a little downpour there. I'm going to focus, though, on the south side of San Antonio. That's where we have the heaviest of the rain. Just moved through China Grove. A little bit of development near Palo Alto College pushing southward into Thelma. This is between 410 and 1604. And one area in particular I want to watch is where we have two outflow boundaries coming together right now. Sutherland Springs to Stockdale all the way down to Poth. This is an area where I foresee future development here. And by future development, I mean momentarily here within the next 15 to 30 minutes. But that's what we have for the activity now locally. We'll take a look at the heaviest accumulations and the highest downpours from what we had today and even yesterday combined. But you look at this last lingering shower moving into Bull Verde, about to cross into Timberwood Park, and this really has affected our temperatures down in the 70s in some instances. Rain chance is really falling off after sunset here. We just have a little bit more time with some of these showers. We'll talk about more rain chances ahead in just a bit. All right, thank you, Adam. He claims he saw his girlfriend attacked and murdered. Today, he took the witness stand. Nicole Perry's body found in November 2020. The man accused of killing her, Rafael Castillo, is on trial this week. And in court today, that witness described what he saw and what he claims Castillo made him do after the woman was killed. Erica Hernandez has today's testimony, and we do want to warn. The details are graphic. Is this the exhibit we were looking on on the ground, kind of by the bed? A machete and axe shown to the jury in day two of Rafael Castillo's murder trial. The alleged murder weapons used to kill Nicole Perry two years ago. Castillo on trial and accused of her murder was emotionless as Randall Fogum talked about the day he claims to have seen Castillo attack his girlfriend, Nicole, in the home they shared after she wouldn't stop mouthing off to Castillo. I start taping her hands up. I turned my head and I, I heard it hit. And it's a sound I will never forget. Fogum went on to say he was frozen and scared. And after the attack was over, he said Castillo ordered him to clean up or he would end up the same way. He was then asked to identify the murder weapon. Is this the axe that Rafael Castillo put in Nikki's head? Mm -hmm. At first, Fogum said he lied to police about what happened because he was in fear of his life, but later said he told the truth because he had nothing to live for without Nicole. Randall's credibility is under question as he does have a lengthy criminal record and is an admitted drug user. The trial will continue tomorrow in the 290th District Court. At the Kalina Reeves Justice Center, Erica Hernandez, KSAT 12 News. Check out traffic right now as we look around with the Trans Guide cameras and we're at 1604 and Pat Booker. All right, we showed you this picture at five o'clock, a deluge out here, and you can see some puddles and some things like that. But the rain has moved on from this area. Of course, coming up a few minutes, Adam Kasky will tell us where it is and where it's going in the days ahead. Tonight, we're also learning the name of a victim in a deadly crash. According to the Bear County Medical Examiner's Office, the victim is 18 year old Rogelio Valenzuela. The crash happened around 2.30 in the morning last Saturday in the 7100 block of Highway 90 West on the city's west side. Police say Valenzuela's truck went off the road, crashed into a light pole. He was pronounced dead at the scene. No other vehicles were involved in that crash. A woman now facing a robbery charge after police say she stole clothes from a Victoria's Secret store and threatened to shoot an employee. An arrest affidavit says that earlier this month, 44-year-old Ana Apreciado put items into a bag at the Victoria's Secret at Ingram Mall. An employee walked up to her, asked her if she needed help. At some point, the affidavit says that Apreciado told the employee, quote, I'm so upset that my gun is too small, I can't grab it, end quote. That was while she was reaching into her purse. Investigators say she then threatened to shoot everyone in the store. Surveillance video was used to identify Apreciado, and she is now charged with robbery. The San Antonio Crime Stoppers asking the public for help finding the suspects in a shooting that left two people dead. 
On April 27th, Jasmine and Evan Scott were killed after police say a car approached the vehicle that the victims were in and began shooting. That's when police say the suspects drove off in the vehicle. It's hard to make out, but that's the vehicle involved that you see there on your screen. Crime Stoppers also looking for information on a man accused of robbing a Northside Jack in the Box restaurant. This happened July 31st. Police say the man demanded money from the cash register and gestured as to having a weapon. The man then left with that money. Anyone with information on either of these crimes can call Crime Stoppers 210-224-STOP. A tax cut, potential money back on your CPS energy bill, and $3.4 billion total. Those some of the main points for the new proposed San Antonio City budget. It was presented to council members today. Garrett Berger takes us to that discussion and what could be the biggest snag before council passes a final budget. What have we reduced from our prior budget into this budget? Well, um, not much. With higher revenue projections for next year, including property and sales tax, the city's proposed budget is nearly 11% larger than this year's. That also includes some one-time federal relief dollars. The budget increases uh, in, in large part because San Antonio continues to grow. Police and fire budgets are set to grow too, but less than the budget as a whole. So they take up a smaller portion than usual. I do think it's, it's good that we are seeing a leveling off of the increase in the public safety budget over time. But the city also plans to cut the property tax rate, which it has to do to stay under a state imposed cap. That cut on top of tax breaks city council already passed for homeowners. I'm happy what we've done to date, but I'm going to keep pushing this until we max out our uh, ability. Much of the budget talk revolved around how to spend a windfall of money from CPS Energy coming in because of soaring temperatures and bills. City staff has proposed kicking $50 million back to customers, most of it divvied up as a one-time credit on October bills, which would net the average homeowner about $31. Bucks. Now, several council members think there are better ways to use the money, like Mario Bravo, who wants to put the money toward preparing for future extreme weather. Solutions that will help reduce all future energy bills, not just one bill. Now the city council will have some budget workshop sessions and there will be a dozen community input sessions, most of those scheduled for the latter half of August. We've got more details on when and where on our website, ksat.com. I'm Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. All right, listen, I know going back to school time can be emotional for parents anyway. Today, many students return to class, including Shirt Cibolo and Universal City ISD students. Parents, students, and staff all aware of the difference in the beginning of this year. The students stepped into their classrooms today, some parents feeling a little unease after recent events like what happened in Uvalde. Others relying on strong law enforcement presence in and around campuses to keep their children safe. One parent able to get a sense of relief after seeing police around the school. Seeing a heavy police presence at the school over the summertime, so uh, that gives me a little bit more reassurance on what's going to be happening and what's going to be going down. So that makes me feel a little bit more comfortable. Despite, concer despite concerns and fears, students were able to enjoy their first day of school and are excited for the year ahead, it seems. In Southwest ISD, student athletes who swim won't have to drive far anymore to hit the pool. That's after the district's grand opening of its own natatorium. It is 35,000 square feet with locker rooms, a weight room, a multi-purpose classroom, and yes, a big old pool. Southwest ISD students tell us they are excited to finally have a place of their own. They used to have to drive to the Northside ISD natatorium to train. It's amazing. We've always been going to other aquatic centers and never really having a place that we can call Southwest's. And so now that we have a place in like our own backyard, it's amazing. The swimming facility cost $24 million to build. $4 million of that came from the city. And more than 6 million Americans have Alzheimer's disease. Double that number you get the number of people caring for them. So knowing the signs of early dementia, also known as mild cognitive impairment, is crucial to the future. Ursula Perry reports it's the only way to get support as soon as possible. She'll talk and send Sandy Vincent never imagined that she would reach retirement age only to become a caregiver again for her 96 year old mother, Margaret. She forgets. She'll call me Sandy. Other times I'm Irene, who was her cousin. 
sometimes she'll say to me, how's your mother? Experts say the top three signs of mild cognitive impairment, or MCI, are memory loss, especially new information, difficulty performing daily tasks, and losing your language skills. Her doctor is a geriatric medicine specialist. As symptoms of MCI begin to appear, she recommends that families help loved ones write down their routines. For some reason, the, the visual pathway seems to be staying longer with the patients. Use post-it notes in a prominent place. They're going in the bathroom, brush your teeth. The simple, like breaking it down in simple steps and putting it on the post-it so that they understand it. If sentences become stilted, determine which words might be troublesome. List others they can use in practice. Losing language skills can lead to depression. They don't remember the words and then they stop talking to people, then they start isolating themselves and then it's sort of a downhill course. There are times where, you know, she'll say, she'll complete sentences and everything and make sense and then there are other times that I guess she can't find the words. Up until just recently, Sandy's mom used to sing her favorite songs from the 1940s. And that's a good thing because it's known that dementia patients can often retain more language through music. It's because musical memories are actually preserved in a part of your brain that is untouched by the disease. Ursula Perry, KSAT 12 News. Do you ever wonder who and how the Spurs logo was first created? Well, next, meet the artist responsible for the design and what inspired him. I'm Stefania Jimenez, and tonight on the Night Beat, it has brought loud noises at late hours to downtown San Antonio. And tonight, there are new concerns about this week's military training. What neighbors are telling us, plus... This one seemed really low compared to what you guys normally have. Yeah, we're going behind the kitchen door. The reason that one restaurant barely passed its health inspection and what inspectors found at another popular spot. Also, a wait list with 1,200 names on the first week of school. Why one after school program says it just can't meet families' needs. We'll see you for these stories and more tonight on The Night Beat. Thanks, Stephanie. The Spurs logo, one of the most recognized pro sports logos across the country. But do you know the story of how it was created? Yeah, RJ Marquez met with a 93-year-old local artist credited with creating that logo that's so synonymous with sports in South Texas. It's an iconic symbol representing San Antonio. But 50 years ago, the artist behind the Spurs logo said it was just another day at the office. New company that we just took on. It's called the Spurs. And so uh, I didn't know anything about it. In 1973, Finnis Collins worked for a local advertising agency named the Pitluck Group. That's when Red McCombs and other investors brought the Spurs to San Antonio. The only thing that they wanted was some way to show the spur as part of the symbol. Collins got to work and two days later came up with three designs. I just ran down to the Whitty Museum, looked at all the spurs they got them on exhibit. Anyway, that's it. So um, this is your design? This is my design. You'll notice that the little nibs here. Collins also drew the original black and gray lettering by hand, creating a 3D look for the team name. Well, this is just right for, for them. They had, a next, they had a meeting the next day. They approved it. They didn't change anything. The original Spurs logo was created and then approved by Red McCombs in just four days. Now the lettering and the points at the bottom of the spur have changed over time, but one thing that has stayed the same is the spur has always been the U right in the middle of the team name. It takes usually a lot of grinding and a lot of work, but in this case, it just went flying through, bang, bang, bang. And Collins also designed the original logos for La Quinta Hotels and Market Square, but his Spurs logo has stood the test of time. Now, I, I don't want to take any credit at all from anybody else because Red McCombs, he, he named it. All I did is do an art piece of artwork that said this is the Spurs. RJ Marquez, KSAT 12 News. I think he did quite a bit. To see that logo all these years later, whole yeah. country recognizes it's it. It's a slam dunk. <laughs>
<laughs> All right, the weather outside, it, this is this is great. Yeah, talk about I'm enjoying this, and it, it seems as if it's pretty widespread, though, across our viewing area, too, which is also a great thing, Adam. Yeah, it has been. We had much better coverage today than what we've had in previous days, and we'll take what we can get, but today is so far the best day this week when it comes to overall rainfall. And we're going to take a look at the overall coverage, and then I'll get back to the actual current rain, but you take a look at the 12 hour rainfall accumulations everywhere. We have a color on the map here. The blues, the greens indicates where rain has fallen and it's been measured by the Doppler radar. We also have some locations west of town where it's so so much farther away from the radar site. We have to switch sites. There you go. Uh, basically cutting off a little bit closer to the Rio Grande, but Hill Country Highway 90 west of town and then even locally some decent accumulations when you Factor in yesterday's rain on the east and northeast side of town. I mean, we're talking 1.8 inches near Madison High School. So that's one part of town that actually got hit twice. A little bit of light rain on the far north side, or I should say moderate to heavy rain along 281 pushing southward, but it's weakening as it moves south right near Camp Mullis pushing southward along 281 and not far from Blanco Road there as well. Light activity on the far west side of town. Unfortunately, you haven't seen the heavy stuff, but just west of SeaWorld, one moderate shower. And then the heaviest of the rain that we had, the alley, alleyway, basically from Selma, Shirts area southward to China Grove. That has since weakened quite a bit uh, near Elmendorf and Calaveras Lake. A little bit of rain left over, but not the same uh, kick that it had earlier when it pushed through San Antonio and the east side of town. Right now, the focus is east of town. I mentioned earlier Sutherland Springs to Stockdale. That's where we're seeing the development. We've got these outflow boundaries coming together and no surprise. This is where the development is happening. Even Floresville getting in on some of the activity right now, and this really doesn't have all that defined motion to it uh, to really plot it out. It basically just develops rains itself out and then you see a new one develop elsewhere, but you go right into the heart of Floresville. There you have it. Some good, heavy soaking rain, at least for a brief period of time. But we will take whatever amount we can get our hands on. And if you missed it today, don't worry. More opportunities exist in the days ahead as we go through the upcoming weekend. Here's a quick look at some of the rainfall totals. At five o'clock, we talked about the east side of town, and I even mentioned uh, Madison High School picked up 1.8 when you combine yesterday and today. Windcrest, we've had some uh, re some radar estimates there of 0.8 inches you get on the far north side of town northwest near UTSA about a quarter to four tenths of an inch down closer to China Grove. You're looking at accumulations of about a quarter to a half an inch. Now the temperatures have had have really been impacted by this. I mean, we're down in the 70s in some locations, so basically near 80 for most of us around Bear County the rest of this evening. Those scattered showers really coming to an end, especially after sunset isolated in nature by 9 10 o'clock. We're talking one or two left over and then some partial clearing. But as I mentioned before, if you missed it today, more opportunities exist because you see this activity here south of New Orleans. That's a little low pressure system that's going to be pushing westward and that's going to keep our rain chances alive through this upcoming weekend. They're not going to be huge, but at least they're there and it'll at least provide us some extra cloud cover to keep us below 100 through the weekend as well. Look at Bernie at 72. Hello to 75 officially at the airport 79 Converse 77 in Bulverde right now at 76 tomorrow 77 in the morning 10% chance of a shower at 7 a.m. by noon a 20% chance and then up to about 30 to 40% into the afternoon. I do think we'll have some pop up downpours tomorrow, but not as much coverage on the map as what we had today. I do think we could make it into the upper 90s tomorrow, mid 90s this weekend, 40% chance Saturday, a Sunday, a 30% chance. So isolated to widely separated in nature and then back to triple digits by next Tuesday. No complaining when you got rain chances in the forecast. No, thanks, Adam. Not at all. All right. The Cowboys finally get to hit somebody that's not wearing the silver star on their helmet. Yes, they went to uh, Denver to hold the joint practice with the Denver Broncos, and it's really designed to give the starting lineups more of a game-like experience. The practice coming up, we have more on that joint practice, and things got heated a handful of times between the two, and right here in town, Dewan Griffin is following in the footsteps of Tariq Woolen. Coming up. 
Camping with KZAT, powered by Davis Law Firm. Dallas and Denver say they got in some good work during their joint practice at the Broncos Training Center near Denver today. Now, things got chippy in the second hour of practice during 11 on 11 drills. Cowboys right tackle Terrence Steele pushes Deshaun Williams down to the end of the play and lands on top of him. That made Williams mad, so he went after Steele and his helmet. And former Cowboy Randy Gregory, who's on the pup list for Denver, got involved as well, chirping at the boys. Coach McCarthy says this should be about practice, not fighting. Absolutely, we don't want we don't want the fights. You know, we're not here to fight. That's that's not. Uh, I don't view it as toughness. So I mean, it's uh, you know, if, if if you throw a punch, you're, you're ejected from the game. So same rules apply here today. And Zeke took a good lick from Broncos linebacker Bradley Chubb on this cutback run. Zeke popped right up as Bradley celebrated. Out in Houston, the Texans took practice inside NRG Stadium ahead of their preseason opener Saturday night with the Saints. Head coach Lovey Smith said some guys aren't going to play, some guys yes, and none of his guys will play the entire game, not the first one at least. Now this contest will mark the first time Lovey and his coaching staff will get to evaluate some of the younger players in a game like rookie safety and second round draft pick Jalen Petrie. I would say I'm still growing, you know, I'm still, you know, understanding the playbook, understanding what offense is like to do in the NFL. And, you know, I love the game of football. So, you know, I love learning every day and I feel like, you know, I'm doing that. So I, I'm just continuing to go up. I feel like I haven't, you know, um, really reached any plateau yet. Like I, I got a long way to go. Houston is scheduled to hold a walkthrough tomorrow before hosting the Saints Saturday night at 7 at NRG Stadium. San Francisco 49ers rookie offensive lineman Spencer Burford is turning heads in his first NFL training camp. Through 11 camp practices, the fourth round pick from UTSA has taken every first team rep at right guard. Right now, he's in line to be the week one starter at Chicago. Has it surprised me? Uh, no, I knew I always had it in me, but at the same time, I'm not really focused on whether it's the starting position or the second string position. I'm just here to play the game that I love and uh, do whatever I can to help the team win. So if they find something in me, thank God. If they don't, I'm going to keep working and put my best foot forward. The Niners will host the Packers tomorrow night at 7.30 in Burford's first pro game. And starting QB Trey Lance said Spencer comes to work every single day like a pro. Fall practice number seven is now in the books for UTSA football. They're a little over three weeks away from their season opener at home September 3rd against the Houston Cougars. The Roadrunners have 10 cornerbacks, cornerbacks on the roster, including redshirt junior Dewan Griffin. He started his college career as a wide receiver, and then he made the move to corner his sophomore season in 2020. Just like former UTSA corner Tariq Woolen, who made the same move the same season as Griffin did. Watching Tariq excel at corner definitely was a good thing for Griffin. Yeah, seeing Reek was definitely like, you know, just try to put myself in his shoes, you know, just seeing, try to see stuff his way. You know, he he actually helped me a lot, you know, just talking me through things like last year, last season, after every practice, you know, he just pulled me to the side, you know, try to coach me up on things, make sure I'm pitching step every time, you know, just playing with technique, really, that type of stuff. Griffin also said he didn't start playing football until his senior year in high school. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, that? look at you transitions there. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks, Larry. We'll be right back. Three people are dead, dozens of homes damaged after a devastating explosion in Evansville, Indiana. An investigation is underway. Authorities saying it's unclear what caused the blast. Ivan Rodriguez has the latest on that investigation and reactions from people who live there. More than 24 hours after a house in Evansville, Indiana, exploded, causing deaths and widespread damage. It was like a bomb just went off near us. People who live in the community are finding it hard to comprehend what happened. All the left side of my house, the windows blew, and I had cracks everywhere. We walked outside and there's this huge plume of smoke coming up from about four or five houses down the way. It, then there was debris and insulation falling on us, like uh, snow. The American Red Cross is stepping in to help the families left homeless. 39 homes were damaged surrounding the blast site and 11 homes are uninhabitable, so they'll have to be demolished. Still the biggest unanswered question how this happened. No cause is determined at this time. Investigation is ongoing, and at this point, it's going to be a very tedious process. It is a tragedy, but it's also a very uh, 
bright shining spotlight on the community spirit of Evansville for all of us to come together and work to resolve uh, this tragedy. At least eight agencies responded, including the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms and Explosives. As the investigation continues, grief-stricken neighbors have been asked to stay away from the area. It devastated me knowing that there was people inside and I don't, it's, it's very heartbreaking. I'm Ivan Rodriguez reporting. The Pennsylvania Congressman Scott Perry will cooperate with investigators following the seizure of his phone. That's according to Perry's lawyer. The Republican said three FBI agents seized his phone Wednesday while he's traveling with his family, presumably to see what his role was with the then Trump White House in efforts to overturn the 2020 election. His lawyer said Perry has directed him to cooperate to make sure the Justice Department gets the information it's entitled to but also to protect information it's not entitled to. He said things like legislative discussions and Perry's communications with his lawyers are off limits. An exhibit at the University of Virginia marks the somber five-year anniversary of the deadly Charlottesville riots on August 12, 2017. That's when a white nationalist drove his car into a crowd of anti-racist demonstrators. He killed a woman protesting against their Unite the Right rally. Dozens of others were hurt. Students who lived in the area created this memorial exhibit. A number of events are also planned around the anniversary this weekend. Gas prices are dropping, but it's getting even more expensive to buy a home. Yes, yeah, some new data giving consumers mixed messages. Chris Wynn reports from Washington. A welcome sight for drivers needing a break. It's a big psychological barrier when you go below $4. Gas averaging $3.99 nationally, according to AAA. Under $4 for the first time since March. American drivers, they can look at this as, as a, a bit of a threshold. We are now below that $4 barrier where a lot of people have decided they're going to change their driving habits. They're going to change their lifestyle. Gas prices may be coming down, but mortgage rates and low inventory continue to present obstacles for potential home buyers. Mortgage rates climbing this week nearly a quarter point to more than 5% on average, significantly higher than this time last year. The biggest challenge confronting a prospective or actual home buyer right now is simply affordability. And they're facing that assault on two fronts, the sharp rise in mortgage rates and and the continuing rise in home prices across the country. But there is some hope soaring inflation could be easing a little. The producer price index reveals wholesale prices decreased half a percent in July over the previous month. But the index was still 9.8 percent higher than it was a year ago. Meanwhile, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi says the House will pass the Inflation Reduction Act on Friday in another bid to ease the pain for Americans. Our focus is to try to keep this progress going, and that's why you see our focus on trying to get this legislation done this week. In Washington, I'm Chris Wynn reporting. Let's talk about those rising mortgage rates. They're above 5% again this week, but just a week ago, rates dipped below that threshold for the first time in months. This increase is still significantly higher than this time last year when it was just 2.87%. Rates rose sharply at the start of the year, hitting a year high in mid-June. Since then, concerns about the economy and the Federal Reserve's mission to combat inflation are driving volatility. Despite that, there are signs showing that the housing market is starting to stabilize. If you drink protein shakes or use milk alternatives like oat milk, specifically those made by Lion's Magnus, you're going to want to check your fridge. A long list of nutritional drink brands made by Lion's Magnus have been recalled due to concerns about potential contamination by two types of bacteria that can make you really sick. One of them is actually the same bacteria that prompted the Abbott baby food recall. This recall is voluntary, expands on another recall a couple of weeks ago. To find out other items recalled, you can go to the FDA's website at FDA.gov. A new invention by engineers at the Southwest Research Institute has them hoping to help solve some challenges in San Antonio. What it has to do with this vehicle, coming up. In this week's Tech SA, a team of engineers at Southwest Research Institute hope their latest invention can help solve some of San Antonio's infrastructure and mobility challenges. Yeah, the engineers have designed a self-driving shuttle equipped with sensors, cameras, and some unique software. Tiffany Huertas went aboard that shuttle to learn how it works. 
Everything that we've developed, we're trying to integrate in the shuttle to kind of showcase. Engineers at Southwest Research yeah, Institute have been working on this self-driving shuttle for over a year, incorporating technology yeah. the Institute has developed over many years. We'll have uh, LIDARs, which are uh, spinning lasers, uh, and we have uh, cameras, which uh, are just uh, taking images of uh, pedestrians, uh, cars and other obstacles along our path. Research engineer Alex Youngs says the shuttle is programmed to drive unique routes around the Institute. The bottom part of the screen we have the Ranger matches. These are we're taking pictures of the asphalt and comparing them to a database of images. So that's how we're staying on track. The shuttle collects data every time it is on the road. That data will show us where we can make improvements, what's already working well. The program is designed to see different objects, including bicycles and pedestrians. Engineers believe this shuttle could help the community in different ways. These types of mobility services can help uh, the uh, disabled, the elderly, uh, and any underserved communities. Alex says we are going to continue to see more of this technology in vehicles and is excited to be part of this project. I like being a part of uh, kind of such a changing and growing industry. Tiffany Huertas, KSET 12 News. Another look outside with live cam, some rain out there in the distance. We've heard the thunder, we've got the lightning, and there's more of that to come, Adam. Yeah, and right now the bulk of the activity is southeast of San Antonio. That's where most of the action has moved now. You can see particularly into Wilson County. This is the sweet spot where these two outflow boundaries have come together. Good soaking rain. We're talking just outside of Lavernia, but about Sutherland Springs to Stockdale, all the way reaching down toward Poth. This is the heaviest rain that's left over right now, gradually ending this evening. We'll have another look at radar and the newest drought monitor along with our rain chances into the weekend coming right up. In the buzz today, fair season is here and these events often give a glimpse into the wacky and wonderful things people see and can do. Check out this sculpture at the Illinois State Fair. Meet the butter cow. Do you know I have actually seen a butter cow before? You know, I did know that. Story. Yeah, at the Iowa State Fair when we were covering the presidential politics there. <laughs> It's exactly what you think it is, a cow carved out of butter. The celebration of cholesterol has been a mainstay at the fair for about 100 years. It takes about five days and 500 pounds of unsalted butter to create. It's done by hand, kept in the dairy building. By the way, that's a dairy cow there. It's utterly fabulous. <laughs> Folks can also pick up ice cream and milk in the dairy building. No actual butter puns? Did we use, use all of those during the commercial break? Well, I said that, that that's, there's a lot of pressure because people are watching when you carve these. There's not a lot of margarine for error. There you go. There you, you go. Lego <laughs> is going big to celebrate its 90th birthday today. It unveiled a massive birthday cake of Legos made from 94,128 bricks and pieces. This video shows all the work employees did to build the nine layer cake, one layer for each of the nine decades of Lego play. Yeah, it's on display at the Lego house in Billen, Denmark. The company is also celebrating with its first World Play Day with events around the world to encourage and help families and communities to play more. I like it. And remembering the words of John F. Kennedy Jr. today, children are the world's most valuable resource and its best hope for the future. Today is National Sons and Daughters Day. It's every August 11th. You could mark this special day, of course, by enjoying a special dinner or just by telling your kids and siblings what they mean to you and what makes them so special. And hopefully you do that more than just right. one day a year. One day, but yeah. appropriate as we all head back to school. Kind of stuff. There you go. Yeah. All right. Let's check out the weather right now. And is the heat of the day going to taper off the rains that we're seeing right now, Adam? Yeah, they've basically zapped all the energy out of the atmosphere right now. So what we have out there is coming to an end, especially locally. I do want to point out the newest drought monitor updated every Thursday. Not a pretty sight for us. All of San Antonio and surrounding counties stretching all the way to Brackettville and into Maverick County, this dark color in the middle exceptional drought. That is the worst category of drought you can be in. Now, this does not take into account any rain showers since 9 a.m. on Tuesday morning. Now, we've had some rain, of course. This is a look at the radar just throughout the day today.
on the drought stricken ground, but it's really a drop in the bucket for what we need. Don't get me wrong. I'm grateful. I'm happy we got it. It's great that it's here. We just need to see more and luckily we do have more rain chances on the way. Here's the latest look at radar. You can see not as much coverage on the radar screen as what we had earlier today, but hey, this is still good. Now just light lingering showers in parts of San Antonio. That's all we have. The heaviest rain. We talked about this a bit ago. Wilson County where we had these boundaries collide and the that's the kind of situation where it's just a wait and see kind of a now casting situation when we say it's going to rely on these outflow boundaries. Well, this is a good example of them coming together, colliding, generating the lift and kickstarting heavy rainfall with a little bit of lightning and thunder, but nothing severe. Lavaca County and we're talking Shiner Molten area, getting some quick splash and dash downpours, but not really lasting all that long. Better than nothing. This is a part of our area where we've actually seen more showers uh, than elsewhere over the past few weeks. But you look at the map as a whole here. I know a lot of the rain has come to an end. You look at the map as a whole and the 12 hour rainfall. This is pretty good coverage. You know, not everybody saw a whole lot of soaking rain, but everywhere we have a color on the map, you know, the blues and greens indicate Doppler radar estimates of actual rainfall. So it shows you where it's rained. Get along 410 on the east side of town here. Let's say right near uh, Rigsby. Okay, 410 and Rigsby Avenue. There you go. Eight tenths of an inch near Sinclair Road. Get up into Windcrest area. Kirby, we're talking an inch of rain. This darker green color. We can go right into Windcrest. We can almost get right into Santa Jim's house here, actually, to be honest with you. <laughs> Balfour, yeah, let's get to it. About 0.8 inches of rain estimated. I did get one report actually from a viewer in Windcrest with a rain gauge indicating one inch. So it's good to see that not as high of accumulations elsewhere today, but at least we did see some showers elsewhere under a half an inch uh, where you see those lighter blues. OK, let's get right to it. Here's our future cast for tomorrow because these showers that we have now tapering off tomorrow. It's going to be similar. We'll have a mixture of sun and clouds and then a few thunderstorms popping up. I don't think we'll have as much coverage as what we had today as what we had today. Notice 2 p.m. Yeah, a few hit or miss showers here and there. A couple of downpours popping up. Better than nothing, but again, not quite as much coverage as today. Rain chances, however, exist all the way through the weekend. Look at our rain cooled air 82 Port SA 79 officially at the airport. Converse 77 divine right now at 75 77 in the morning tomorrow. 98 the high temperature only a 20% chance at noon and then up to a 30% chance into the afternoon. So yes, some development, but it's going to be more isolated in nature and we're not going to have as much on the radar screen. Temperatures for the most part tomorrow just below 100. Castroville 98, Seguin 96, and even down into the lower 90s in some spots at 93 what we're forecasting in Bulverde. Here's a look at the extended forecast. Notice Saturday 40% chance Sunday a 30% chance. So odds are still alive. They're not significant, but at least chances exist into the upcoming weekend. And really those odds hinge on a system in the Gulf of Mexico, and there's a lot of uncertainty on exactly where that system is going to go. So of course we'll be fine tuning that forecast in the days ahead. And by next Tuesday, talking triple digits again. A lot of weather to talk about today. It's good. I like having a lot of weather to talk about and not just sunny and 100 degrees, but I did have some time to get uh, more scales made these past couple of mornings. You know, a good spreadsheet, good measurements, good calibration synergy with these scales. I do have a winner today. <laughs> uh, that was for you, Myra. Yeah. All I appreciate right. that. Crystal Stapp of San Antonio, the winner of the homemade thermometer. You can go to ksat.com slash thermometer to enter the drawing. So I have a lot of thermometers made. I just need to get going on the backboards for these ones now. So this is what, is this for Myra? You can't, this, synergy, you can't beat it. Okay. The, the synergy right. of the scales. Didn't know this calibrate. synergy. Oh yeah, okay, good. And accurate. In case you missed it, coming up next. Synergy. Hi there, it's Thursday, August 11th. 
extreme heat has led to extreme balances for CPS Energy customers, which is why city staff is proposing some relief that would reflect in customers' October energy bills. An average of $31 credit that would be applied to an October bill. For the funds to be reflected in October bills, it will need to be voted on by September. However, city council says more discussion needs to happen, which will begin next week during the first budget work sessions. Police have shell casings from two different guns, but no suspect. This after someone shot another person in the jaw on the west side around three this morning. It happened on South Bernardo Avenue, not far from South General McMullen. Officers say the victim was taken to the hospital and is okay. So far, police have not arrested anyone in this case. ABC News reporting that Trump was subpoenaed in the spring for documents he's believed to have taken from the White House. He never turned over to federal investigators those documents, apparently. Right now, it's unclear if he ever handed them over following that subpoena. We've also learned earlier this year several boxes containing classified information were taken from Trump's Florida home. This isn't the only legal case against the former president. This week, Trump pled the fifth in a deposition with New York State Attorney General, who's investigating him for tax fraud. Red Lobster found one last month and now they found their second. A lobster expert with Ripley's Aquarium says the lobsters get their coloring from foods that they eat. These two found in the same part of Mississippi. Red Lobster took them to an aquarium instead of a pot of boiling water. Remember the first one was named Cheddar. They named this one Biscuit.